I'm working through the reaction rate section of the 2019 chemistry paper and the section on rates of reaction has a multiple choice question which is question 1.4 in this paper. Question 1.4 reads the following. Which one of the following sets of values for activation energy and heat of reaction is possible for a reaction? Now, immediately when we see these two terms, activation energy and heat of reaction, we should be thinking about our endo and exothermic graphs, the one showing for an endothermic reaction showing that the heat of reaction is positive and we know that this over here is our activation energy and an exothermic graph which shows that the heat of reaction is a negative value and the activation energy once again remains the same. From this we can see a couple of things. We can see firstly that it is not possible for the heat of reaction to be equal to the activation energy because that would imply that the graph then would look something like this, which we know is not possible. It is also not possible for the heat of reaction to be greater than the activation energy. So if we now start by looking at our possible answers, option A, the activation energy and heat of reaction are the same, which we've said cannot be possible. Option B, the heat of reaction is greater than the activation energy, which is also not possible. Option C, much like option A, where heat and activation energy are the same, is not possible, which leaves only option D as a possible answer, because that shows there that we then have an endothermic reaction. So the correct answer to question 1.4 is D. The standard question for rates of reaction is question 5 in the chemistry exam and question 5 reads as follows. The calcium carbonate in antacid tablets reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid according to the following balanced equation, the equation given here. Question 5.1 is the above reaction exothermic or endothermic and give a reason for your answer. Now we always look at our enthalpy change to determine whether a reaction is endo or exothermic. Here we can see that the enthalpy change is negative, which tells us that this reaction must be exothermic. A negative enthalpy change always implies that the reaction is exothermic because it means that energy is given off, and that would be your explanation, either energy given off or simply stating that the enthalpy change is negative. A negative enthalpy change is always associated with an exothermic reaction, which we know is a reaction that gives off heat. Question 5.2. An antacid tablet of mass 2 grams is placed in hydrochloric acid. After 30 seconds, the mass of the tablet was found to be 0.25 grams. Question 5.2. Calculate the average rate in grams per second of the above reaction. And we start out by giving some sort of formula. This formula would just tell us that the average rate here is going to be equal to the change in mass of this tablet over the change in time. And the question has asked for the rate measured in grams per second. So we give the change in mass where we have been told that the mass ends as 0.25 with a starting mass of 2 grams and the amount of time that passed was 30 seconds. You'll note here that I have included a negative sign. That is simply because we are measuring the reactant which is being used up and by including this negative sign I'm showing that the rate is going to be given as a positive value given in grams per second. This negative sign is not entirely necessary because to quote the rate as being negative is not wrong because it is the rate at which the reactant is being used up. So either one of these would be acceptable. The answer, as you will see, is actually 0 0.0583, but this questions or this paper always requires that you round to two decimal places, which we round to 0 0.06 grams. Question 5.3. 
reads as follows. The antacid tablet contains 40% calcium carbonate. Another antacid tablet of mass 2 grams is allowed to react completely with hydrochloric acid. Calculate the volume of carbon dioxide, CO2, that will be collected at standard temperature and pressure. Assume that all the CO2 produced is from the calcium carbonate. And so our starting point for any stoichiometric calculation like this is to calculate a number of moles. This cannot be done immediately though because we have been told that we have a 2 gram tablet but this 2 gram tablet is only 40% calcium carbonate. So our first calculation is to calculate the actual mass of calcium carbonate that is present in this tablet and that is done by taking the mass of the tablet given as 2 grams and multiplying it by 40% or 40 over 100 to find that the actual mass of calcium carbonate present in this tablet is 8 grams. Now, in any stoichiometric calculation, we need to convert any mass that's given us into a number of moles. We do that by saying the number of moles of calcium carbonate must be equal to the mass of calcium carbonate that is present, divided by calcium carbonate's molar mass, that is 0.8 divided by the molar mass of 100 grams per mole, which we then write in scientific notation as 8 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of calcium carbonate. Once again, the question has asked us how much carbon dioxide we produce, which means that the ratio of calcium carbonate to carbon dioxide is important. And this ratio is obtained from the equation where we can see that the coefficients for both of these is 1, which means that these react in a ratio of 1 to 1, which means that for every 1 mole of calcium carbonate that reacts, we form 1 mole of carbon dioxide. So since we have calculated that 8 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of calcium carbonate react, that means we will form 8 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of carbon dioxide. And finally, we go back to the question which says that we want to know what volume of carbon dioxide is produced at STP. Now the statement at STP means that we can use the standard molar gas volume to say that the volume of carbon dioxide produced must be equal to the number of moles of carbon dioxide that we have calculated multiplied by the molar gas volume. This comes from the formula number of moles is equal to volume divided by molar gas volume and that then allows us to substitute in here 8 times 10 to the negative 3 the amount of carbon dioxide produced is equal to the number of moles times this molar gas volume which tells us that one mole of any gas at STP will occupy 22.4 cubic decimeters and therefore we can say that the number of moles of carbon dioxide produced would be 0.18 cubic decimeters. Question 5.4 goes on. The reaction rate of a similar antacid tablet with excess HCl of concentration 0.1 molar moles per cubic decimeter at a different temperature is measured. The graph below was obtained and here we can see that this graph gives one over time which we can also refer to as rate. When you divide by time you're always finding the rate of a reaction. Use the information in the graph to answer the following questions. Question 5.4 Write down one controlled variable for this investigation. Now, in any investigation, there are going to be a number of controlled variables. A control variable is something that must be kept constant in order for it to be a fair experiment. The three acceptable answers here were the concentration of HCl, because the concentration was kept constant so that only the temperature would be what affected this. The second possible control variable was the size or the mass of the antacid tablet because we once again want to make sure that the same concentration and amount of reactant is present. And finally, the state is also important. Obviously, it would not be a fair experiment if we used powder in the one form for the tablet and 
a solid in the other. So the state is also important. Again, there are always multiple control variables, but we try to identify the most important ones first. Question 5.5, write down a conclusion that can be made from this graph. And from this graph, we can clearly see that as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases with it. So our conclusion here is the reaction rate increases with an increase in temperature. It is important when asked to give a conclusion that you refer to all of the variables that are present on this graph, in this, in this case reaction rate and temperature. Other possible answers were reaction rate decreases with a decrease in temperature. Either way, we are trying to show that they are proportional to each other. Question 5.6. Use the collision theory to fully explain the answer to the above question, question 5.5. And so we would explain this by going along the lines of increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy of the particles that are present. We know that when we increase the temperature, the kinetic energy increases, which means that these particles move around faster. What this then means is we say, therefore, there are more molecules that have sufficient kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy or that have a kinetic energy that is greater than the activation energy. And as a result, we will therefore have more effective collisions, which therefore means that we have a faster rate. It is also possible here to refer to saying that since the particles are now moving faster, there are going to be more collisions per unit time. Since there are more collisions, there will be more effective collisions, and therefore we will have a faster rate. Finally, question 5.7 reads, redraw the graph above in the answer book. On the same set of axes, sketch the curve that will be obtained if HCl of concentration 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter is now used, and label this curve Y. Important when drawing curves like this, make sure that it is big enough and easy to interpret. And we once again show that we have rate on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis where we draw in our initial curve. And all that we need to show is that when there is a greater concentration of one of the reactants, the rate for the entire experiment is going to be faster. Otherwise, temperature will still have the same effect. And so we draw a line that is as close as possible to being parallel. To and we now show that the reaction or the curve that we label Y is the curve that has a higher reaction rate overall because of the greater concentration of one of our reactants. The rates of reaction questions are very similar in that they follow this type of trend and there is always going to be a question that requires you to use collision theory to explain an answer and it is important to go through the number of steps that are required. Those steps would usually be the change in how it affects the energy or the movement of the molecules, how the movement of the molecules affects the number of collisions, how the number of collisions affects the number of effective collisions and what effect that then has on the overall what rate of reaction.